depending on what you believed about God. And the three things in the West and the East that we believe about God is that he is immortal, he can't die, he's immutable, he can't change, and so forth. Yes, oh, okay. And this all would affect, if God is immutable, if God can't change, if God is ever powerful, all powerful, then how could God die? If he is God, if the word is God, how could he grow in wisdom, strength, and the like? If he is God, how can he be like us and age and eat and do all the bodily functions that we all do? That would be inelegant for a God. And so that brought up all kinds of questions. And it was one of the things that uh, most pagan critics really pointed at. How can you believe that this person who's just newly born and died as a criminal in Rome, how could this be God? So that was one of the major things that they pointed at because their own understanding of God's was very different. Now, many were the attempts to defend various understandings of the divine and how it could work in Jesus. And we're gonna concentrate on one that was probably the most important uh, problem for the church. Now realize that most heresies were Eastern. Greeks never found a word or a concept that they couldn't tear apart and make lots of little pieces out of. And this idea of a God-man was perfect grist for that mill. So I'm gonna talk about the largest controversy, uh, two controversies that faced the church about the person of Christ. There were many others, as I, you, you know, throwing out Sabellianism and Gnosticism and so forth. It's, each one of those would be its own, uh, its own, turn, uh, own lecture. But we're gonna deal with Arius and Nestorius, okay? Now, Arius was a priest from Alexandria. That was the capital of Egypt, and the capital especially of Roman Egypt, so it was a very wealthy place. Now, his bishop was the saintly Alexander of Alexandria. Arius was a theologian, Everybody was a theologian in those days. Um, and he wanted to safeguard his understanding of the Godhead. And particularly, he wanted to safeguard the idea of immutability. God can't change. God is perfect as he is. So how then do we get a son of God who comes to earth, takes on a human uh, form, lives and dies and, ri and rises from the dead. How does that work into the immutability of God? Now, the other part of that question is, well, if he wasn't divine, if he could change, how was our salvation brought about? because only God could do that. So here he was caught with something that told him Jesus couldn't be God because he grew in age and wisdom. And yet, if he wasn't God, we weren't saved. This is his conundrum. His solution was rather brilliant at the time and, and brought a lot of people's attention to it. His idea was that before even time began, God made a special creation. With a special creative event, he took part of himself and brought forth the word, the Son. So therefore, this wasn't part of physical creation, but it was part of another way out there divine creation before time began. Time is a human concept, not in God. In this way, the word 
could be in some way divine, sharing his father's essence, but not of quite the same stature as his father, who was the creator originator. So it allowed him then to have a son, but not from eternity. So it's a problem with John, in the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Arius would have defined that in the beginning of time, the word was with God and the word was God. So that, but his catchphrase was, there was a time when the word was not. There was a time when the word was not. So, the word then came into being by this, by this special uh, creation of God the Father. Well, you can imagine this might have caused some problems. Bishop Alexander <clears throat> was absolutely horrified because Arius was receiving a large popular following. And quite a lot of this following was from Oriental bishops, particularly the bishops that came out of Antioch, and uh, Syrian Antioch. They could understand this idea, uh, and it did save for them the idea of the immu immutability of God. So he had both heavy critics and heavy backers. So he was excommunicated by Alexander, Arius was, and uh, thrown out of the city, expelled from Alexandria. But he went around and started preaching his idea and gaining his following. Now, two of his most important followers, one was uh, the, the church historian Eusebius of Nicomedia, a uh, wonderful book to get, by the way, if you want to read about early church history, get his book on it. Uh, Hello. Oh, yeah, that would help. <laughs> One, two, three. There we go. Okay. Um, Arius was excommunicated, thrown out of Alexandria. He then went around gathering followers. Uh, Eusebius of Nicomedia was the first uh, church historian and also became a great friend of Constantine, the emperor. Uh, and another powerful person behind him was Eusebius of Nicomedia. The Greek church is now being torn in two by these two camps, the Arians and the Orthodox. They wouldn't call themselves Orthodox yet, but they would soon to be, uh, pick up that title. Constantine was gravely concerned. Now you will remember that Constantine became the single emperor of the Roman world, and therefore, well, first he became the duo emperor of the world with Licinius, and they both then made a declaration that Christianity was going to be a religion with all of the, the perks of every other religion. It was to be allowed, it was not to be uh, harassed, but it wasn't going to be the official religion. That was going to happen later. But by making it legal and showing it great preference, which Constantine did, people began to read the writing on the wall, and so many people became Christian because it was a smart thing to do, not out of any great, great love of Christianity, but realizing that to move ahead in Constantine's world, you either had to be brilliant at what you did or you had to be a Christian, or both. So, he decided his intention had been that he would use the Christian church because of its structure. By this point, we had the Monarchian uh, episcopacy so that each diocese had one head and then priests and deacons and deaconesses and so forth under them. But it had one head in order to have one person who could guard orthodoxy. 
And he thought that that was the perfect kind of church to use to unite his kingdom, his em empire. Because if you were a pagan and you were worshiping Zeus, well, everywhere you went, there was another Zeus. There was the shrine of Zeus of Nicomedia, the uh, Zeus Nike, and several others. And every other, every other ones of the gods, same thing would happen. They would be different because they were increted from the local gods and took on the name of the Roman gods. So it got very complicated. However, here was a system, he thought, that he could use to unite his people. And here it was, seemingly tearing it, uh, itself apart for what he could only look at and think of as words. What did it mean? I don't understand it. I mean, he was not a theologian. He liked to be the head of the church, but he didn't like, he was not about to go in and start looking at this. Uh, he actually, Constantine wasn't baptized until his deathbed, so he was emperor for some uh, 27 years, I believe, and then was baptized on his deathbed um, because he knew he was going to have to do some pretty nasty things as emperor. And you were not allowed uh, forgiveness after baptism at the beginning. Not for grave sins. At any rate, in an attempt to heal the conflict, first he called on his spiritual advisor, Hosius of Cordoba, who was a Western bishop from Spain, and he sent him around to Antioch and to the other centers where, that were supporting Nestorius and finding out what was going on. When he got to Antioch, he was able to bring uh, the bishop there to a local council, and the local council also condemned Arius, but there were a lot of bishops that just held back. So, and since most of the bishops were from the east of the empire, Constantine called them all together to have a council, the first council of Nicaea. Originally, it was supposed to have appeared in Ankara, uh, but there were problems there, so then they moved it to Nicaea, which was closer to Constantinople, which meant he could have a closer hands-on uh, touch, shall we say. Uh, to this council, which was called by the, the emperor, not uh, a bishop or pope, the pope did not come, but he sent a delegation of a couple priests and some deacons. The majority of the bishops there were Eastern bishops because they were the ones that were involved in this controversy. It had not gone yet to uh, bother Rome, so they didn't quite understand what was going on with this thing. It was, however, presided, o it was, however, presided over by uh, Bishop Hosius of Cordoba. He's still Constantine's chief bishop at this point. In the end of the council, Arius was condemned. His view of Christ as God, but sort of a lesser God, was thrown out by the Orthodox. And the church fathers adopted the first version of what we call the Nicene Creed. It would be amended later because of the Holy Spirit and also wanting to uh, pull out again, Midrash, on the Christ, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Um, now the problem that happened during this council when they were dealing with who this Christ was, they wanted to say that he was of the same nature as the Father. But there wasn't a word in scripture that says that. So they went to the Greek, and uh, this was done, we think, by Athanasius, because he was the deacon of his bishop uh, at the council. And it's very likely that he wrote most of the uh, Nicene Creed, the original Nicene Creed. And um, why did I bring that up? Anyway. <laughs> but they, were, they needed a word to describe the relationship of the essence of the Father and the Son. And they came up with a word called homoousios, of the same substance, homoousios. And this is a word not found in scripture and therefore a lot of bishops opposed it because they only wanted something they could defend by scripture. Can't do that if it's not in scripture. But they, most of them either 
gritted their teeth and, or held their nose and signed the document. Quite a few of them tried to run out of town before the document was going to be signed, uh, but Constantine sent people after them to make them sign, so finally almost everyone did. A few people didn't, and they were deposed. Of the same substance, homoousius. Later, uh, of course, not everybody agreed with all of this, and a lot of the bishops went home and became either condemned for their Arianism, or they began to look for some kind of a compromise and became what we would call semi-Arians. Yeah, he's God, but yeah, I'm not quite sure how. So, um, so this led to many, many other questions. Why could it not be taught from scripture, for instance? Parts of the church would be lost to orthodoxy over this question, part would remain. The Far East, Syria and so forth, went, eventually went off uh, into what was called the Nestorian heresy, but that's coming up later. Um, but they also were very chief supporters of the Arian question. Uh, and that would keep going on for hundreds of years because when the Arians, many of the Arians were um, condemned and thrown out of the church because they refused to come to the uh, Nicene formulary, they became missionaries, some of them, and some of them went to what we called Germany. And they converted the Goths to Arian Christianity, which would bring no end of trouble to Rome once the Goths started to descend on the city of Rome. So 400 years of turmoil on Rome came because they didn't involve themselves in this council. <laughs> Some people would say that. Um, and over the years, other councils would be called because further questions needed to be plumbed about the nature of Christ. This one thing didn't do it. Then, uh, then to go to Constantinople, the second council, that was when they midrashed on the creed, and that's where we get the creed in mostly in the form we have it now. The form we use in the West is not the form the Orthodox use because we were imposed by, um, although it started earlier, by, the, uh, by 800, by Charlemagne, the emperor of the West now, to have all of the churches in the West worship the way he worshiped in his chapel at Aachen. And by that point, the phrase the, uh, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son was imposed on the creed for the West. And there were a few other phrases that were imposed on the creed that aren't in the creed in the Eastern churches. Eastern churches refused to accept them because they said only a council could amend the belief statement of the church. Now, in the 360s, in an anti-Aryan reaction, because Arianism was still a big problem, the Bishop of Laodicea in Syria, Apollinaris, led the church into a new crisis. Apollinaris wanted to defend the reality of the incarnation. That's what he wanted to do, just as Arius wanted to defend the immutability of God. He wanted to defend the reality of the incarnation. And for him, the virgin birth was of first importance for dogma, for ritual, for an understanding of sacrament. So Mary's popular title, Mother of God or Theotokos, was very important for that faith. Because only if she were Mother of God could God have come into the world. He, however, declared that in his opinion, in Jesus, the word took place of the human mind. Problems. Now, this prevented him from thinking of Jesus as uh, having a dual personality, being sort of schizophrenic. Am I God today? Am I G a man today? Am I God? He wanted to avoid that idea by saying that the word was the spark that moved Jesus. Well, can anybody see a problem with that? No. <laughs> okay. The problem with that is a phrase that Irenaeus said, what was not assumed was not saved. And if Jesus did not have a human mind and only a divine mind or a human will and only a divine will, then the mind 
or the will weren't saved. Jesus had to assume all of it. Now, in the working, how he worked it out, I have no idea, but it had to be there. For him to be truly God and truly man, he needed all aspects of our humanity. In 428, a priest from Antioch named Nestorius, who was known as a great preacher, was chosen by the emperor at that time to become the new patriarch of Constantinople because he wanted a great preacher for his church. Now, he was brilliant, but he was intemperate. He was really a nasty individual, actually. Um, and he had very little understanding of either church or imperial politics. He was a backwoods boy. And imperial politics, you had to be very careful what you did. The, um, the actual court was run by a eunuch. Uh, and uh, when Nestorius showed up after being chosen, the eunuch let it be known that he would really appreciate a thank you gift. So Nestorius, being a good bishop, sent him a piece of consecrated bread. He sent it back with a note saying something else might be better. <laughs> something maybe in gold. Well, Nestorius, he didn't get involved in that. Um, and he also managed to offend and insult the empress. Not a good thing to do because they were f very powerful people. And so she's working behind the scenes with the eunuch to get rid of this guy. There's also a fight going on between two schools of theology, the school of Antioch and the school of Alexandria. Both were very important learning centers. Both had very different ideas about how you dealt with scripture. Antioch believed in a very realistic interpretation, no, no allegory. So you didn't take the Song of Solomon, for instance, which is a, a beautiful love song, which we'll, we'll be using later, and say, well, it's really just an allegory of God searching out the Holy Spirit. He said, no, it's a love song. And this story meant what the story says. It doesn't mean this interpretation of the story. Well. Alexandria believed that you took the written word and then you went off because then you began to delve into the hidden meanings of the various scriptures and stories such as the Song of Solomon. Um, at one point, he attacked the use of the term Theotokos, which was now completely accepted throughout the church, absolutely loved by all the people, because they loved their mother of God. They were a little afraid of the son because he was, in, he was clothed with all the dignity of a Byzantine emperor. The garments of an emperor were, were put on him. The scowl and the authority of the emperor were put upon him. So it's a little hard to approach the emperor. So instead, mom, so they could go to Mary and they loved her. Um, He decided that what people should say, instead of calling Mary Theotokos, the God, the bearer of God, the bringing forth of God, bringing to birth of God, they should say she is Christokos. She brought forth the Christ, the human, because she had nothing to do with the development of the divine in her womb, which is perfectly good theology. But, Attacking the term that everybody loved destroyed him. They, and the bishop who, who led the charge against him was the Patriarch of Alexandria, Cyril of Alexandria. Also, not a nice guy. I mean, I always cringe whenever I have to say, say, uh, uh, celebrate a mass on St. Cyril's feast day. Uh, he's a saint because he was right, but his methods were less, shall we say, than charitable. Um, and he used every trick in the book to get Nestorius. Um, he declared that what Nestorius was doing was not just 
denying a title to Mary, but was rather denying the divinity of Christ. That if Mary was only a Christo, uh, Christokos, well, where was the divine part? How did that come in? So he's denying that Jesus was divine. That's what he said. It's not what Nestorius said. Nestorius was um, in real trouble now. So S Cyril, ruthless and consummate politician, rallied the troops of the Eastern bishops. There was a council called, again by the emperor, for Ephesus, and he brought all of his clergy there early. Now, John of Antioch was the bishop who was in charge of, of uh, providing support for Nestorius. And they, all those bishops were coming across the sea to get to there, and they ran into really bad weather. So not only was Cyril and his group there already, but John was going to be was six days late. Now, seeing a great opportunity, and Cyril never passed up a great opportunity, he decided he'd go ahead with the council, even though the other side wasn't there. So he brought all of his bishops into the church, the first church dedicated to the Virgin Mary, which was in Ephesus, which is now in ruins, but it's, you can still, if you walk into Ephesus on one side, you can still find it there. Um, brought all the bishops in there, heard themselves talk about what they thought, and then they condemned Arius, uh, Nestorius. They condemned him as um, a, a heretic. They condemned him as someone who was undermining the faith. They condemned him as a person that was out to destroy the church. The one good thing that happened, well, there were a number of things, but in, for our purposes, the one good thing that happened at uh, Ephesus was that the title of Mary, Mother of God, was saved for the church. And it was described, yes, Mary did have no uh, bringing forth, uh, nothing to do with the development of the Godhead in her womb, but it was the God in her womb, therefore she did bring forth the Savior, God. So the title was given back to the church, and the controversy then continued. The semi, uh, the, as I said, the missionaries went off and converted Germany and other places. A lot of the bishops sort of gave approval, but not really. And the controversy continued until several other councils would happen. Um, Cyril, for instance, he, want, he, was, he went to this council with an agenda that they also had to condemn several other people um, who came from the school of Antioch. He really wanted to kill everybody who was his, uh, his adversary. So he wanted them to condemn three people who had already died, one of whom who was considered a saint, Theodore of Mopsuepsia. Theodore, Theodore, and um, who was the third? I'll have to think about it. Anyway, so th three bishops. Theodore of Mopsuepsia was one of the great theologians of his day. He died in uh, odor of sanctity. He was considered a great saint by many of the churches, and especially the churches of the East, the uh, Assyrian churches. They considered him to be the commentator on their liturgy. He did a lot of writing. And so they refused to condemn him. And so, and they were great missionaries that went east. So they took their version of who this Christ was, not using the term Theotokos, but they still taught orthodox doctrine. It's just because they wouldn't use that term, they, were de they also were declared and condemned as Nestorians. They never met Nestorius. They just didn't want to condemn their saint, Theodore of Motswepsia. But they went as far as China in their missionary work. We have, uh, in Hong Sui, we, there is a monument in the cemetery that on one side is written in Chinese, the other side is written in Syriac, the language of, of uh, the Chaldean church. And uh, they've, in the 1840s, I think they discovered a whole trove of documents that were written in Syriac and in Chinese from the church that had been buried 
during one of the persecutions of the church by the government. So the government saved what they were trying to destroy. But Cyril, he, well, he got them condemned, but he wasn't able to get part of the rest of his agenda carried through, condemnations of other things, of certain writings and certain people. And so he compromised on that. They didn't have to condemn them yet. They'd be condemned later. But when he went back to Alexandria, his followers thought that he had betrayed them by this compromise. And they became what is called the Monophysite Church in Alexandria, which then passed further down into Africa into the Coptic and the Ethiopian churches. And Monophysitism is the theory, because Cyril was teaching that it was the divine part of Christ that brought salvation, whereas the Antiochenes said it was the human part of Christ that brought forth salvation. So it was Christ as in his humanity that saved us for them, whereas Cyril, it was his divinity. And therefore, the Monophysites took that a little bit further. You don't have to go too far. And this was the theory that in Christ, there was only one nature. And that nature was not consubstantial with humanity. So everything else was, was shared in the Christ, except that that nature, that divine nature, was not part of the human. How they worked that out is beyond me, but it was in defense of their understanding of the divine was the salvific part of Jesus, and this was the logical outcome. Therefore, they were condemned at council and broke off from the Orthodox Church, and for the next 200 years, they kept trying to figure out a way to bring them back, to get them returned to Orthodoxy. But something happened in 600. Anybody know what happened in 600? There was a merchant in Mecca, and he began to have visions, and he began to have followers. And one of the first things they did once they had subdued the whole Arabian Peninsula was to head toward the Christian areas. They came in, swept into Alexandria, took it over, and so there was never to be a rapprochement between the Monophysites and the uh, Cal Chalcedonian Christians. And ironically, and here we're beginning to get into liturgy, it was in defense of the Chalcedonian Christianity against Monophysitism that the Trisagion, do you know what the Trisagion is? Okay, it is a, a hymn. It was actually started in the Syriac churches and then it was taken over by the Greek churches. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and mortal one, have mercy on us. Qaddisha Allah, Qaddisha Khelthana, Qaddisha Lama Yutha Ithrachem Alem. That's a Syriac version. Um, some people then took that and added, who was crucified for us before have mercy on us, which then made it a song about the Christ, which is not what the Trisagion is about. It is, you say it three times literally because of the Trinity. So then it was brought back in another controversy, they love controversies, another controversy back to its original form as we have it today. Holy God, holy and mighty, Holy and immortal. Actually, th the words are holy, non, not dying one. Have mercy on us. So that is what you need to know for us to get into the next part of what we're going to do here today, or at least what you're going to do with me, not the next part of what you're going to do. So um, are there any questions? If there are no questions after that one. <laughs> yes. How about a, a timeline of Eastern church history? The question was, is there any kind of a timeline? <laughs> Actually, I also have a, a banner that would stretch from that to the, over there on, uh, that I drew up on paper when <laughs> one of my uh, iconography instructors asked me to do a history chart <laughs> 
of this period. So it started there and it showed who the emperor was, who the pope was, who the patriarch of this, that, and the other, what happened, and it just goes on forever. So yes, there are, and you're in danger. <laughs> Another question? A good, a very good book to read if you're interested in the, the development of the early church is, uh, this is Henry Chadwick's uh, Penguin Classics, The Early Church. You can find it almost anywhere. It's a great read and will take you into all kinds of wonderful places you never expected to be and you never thought you'd find the church there. That's a very good one. Uh, it's called the, uh, the Early Church <laughs> by Henry Chadwick. Uh, there's, an, uh, there's another one. Let's see. Cardinal, I had his name earlier. I'll, I'll, bring you a, I'll bring you a reading list tomorrow. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Well, it's, you mean, when what started? Just the church? Yeah. Well, if you take, and, nope, there it is. If you look at a map of Paul's journeys, he went, uh, in one of the journeys, he went to up the coast of what is now Turkey. And that's where a great deal of these cities are. Some are inland, some are uh, closer to the, uh, coast, but that's pretty much what he followed, the trade routes. So he doesn't do a lot in the interior of Greece, but he does do a lot around the harbors. So um, that's how Ephesus became part of this. But then when he would uh, move along, uh, it is thought that John the Apostle took Mary to Ephesus in fleeing the persecutions that were going on. And they'll show you the house where she lived, and, and Catherine Emmerich is supposed to have uh, uh, had it, seen it in a vision, so they have now restored that. Um, the Basilica of St. John is this enormous uh, structure on the other side of the city uh, that had some pretty impressive ruins, and particularly the baptistry is, is quite nice. There is, between that area and uh, the city proper, the ancient city proper, a marsh and in the middle of that march is one single column, fluted column with Corinthian tops. That is all that is left of one of the seven wonders of the world, the Temple of Diana. Because Diana was the patroness goddess of Ephesus. And her great temple was there. And they used to every year parade her statue from that, from that temple into the city in a long uh, celebration, m multiple celebrations, but uh, all the rest of, the, of it were torn down and carted off by Theodosius and Justinian to build their cities. Um, so yeah, it, it's, <sighs> we have a past. <laughs> yes, anyone else? Wow, okay. Right. Well, those were the two. F those were two schools of theology. Right. And Nestorius was. He was an Antiochene. Oh, he, he was from Antioch. Antioch. No, not uh, yes. Nestorius was from Antioch. Arius was from Alexandria. Okay. No one. I'm. Mean, you're probably scared. <laughs> well. What we're going to, what I want to do after this, tonight we're ju it's going to be sort of an open discussion about um, the incarnation. So I, that should be as well. The incarnation is not something that happened once and then went away. It is the center of what we do. Uh, and then I'm going to be talking uh, for the rest of the lectures about music in the church, in the Eastern churches. Uh, and some of the uh, artists that wrote uh, hymns for the church, two in particular. Uh, one is a Syrian, and the other one is a, a Roman, uh, Romanus and Melodius, and then Ephraim the Syrian are the two that we'll be dealing with, some of their poetry and songs. 
and also dealing with uh, images of the Madonna at the Theotokos and explaining how they portray that in iconography. So that's where we'll, we will be going, and I hope you'll be happy to head. I don't think, yeah, he does want to. <laughs> All right, are we okay? All right, well, thank you very much. Go eat.